Hello and welcome to Critical Care Fundamentals. These lectures are meant to be brief and the goal is to give you, the busy provider, a basic framework of critical care topics. My name is Frank Lodicerto. I'm a clinical associate professor at the Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. I also serve as the Critical Care Fellowship Program Director at Geisinger Medical Center in Danville, Pennsylvania. And I also work in the adult and pediatric critical care units here at Geisinger. Today's topic is the management of shock. It's part one. We're also going to do a second part, but I do encourage you to go back and listen to the basics of shock before uh, going on or at some point after you listen to this. So three objectives over the next two talks. Number one is to explain uh, why hypotension is an emergency or should be considered an emergency. We're going to list the catecholamine drugs and their mechanisms of actions and uses. And we're going to talk at the end uh, in part two about some of the uh, newer drugs for refractory vasoplegia. So let's get started. First, let's talk about why is it so important to maintain a mean arterial blood pressure of, let's say, 65 millimeters of mercury. Where did the 65 millimeters of mercury come from? Was it just passed down from generation to generation by the critical care gods, or is there something to it? Well, uh, I'm going to show you that there is probably something to it, at least starting with a mean arterial blood pressure of 65 and then figuring out what each patient's blood pressure uh, should be maintained at. So we need to be rescuers, we need to be superheroes or rescuers of the mean arterial blood pressure. So this was a very large study. Uh, and again, I put the reference here and I'll put this in the show notes as well, some of the other studies I mentioned uh, during these uh, podcasts. But this looked at uh, nearly 30,000 patients or non-cardiac surgery patients uh, in the OR. And you can see both of these graphs um, that I'm, I'm showing you here, the, this side is the probability of acute kidney injury and the probability of uh, myocardial injury. Now you can see the probability starts to increase as the patient's mean arterial blood pressures um, uh, drop below 65, which is right about here. You can see the probability increases uh, of both acute kidney injury and uh, of myocardial uh, injury. And now even short stints, about five minutes of hypotension, led to or could lead to significant acute kidney injury and myocardial events. So we need to be, as I mentioned, rescues of the map and not waiting around and see if the blood pressure will get better with a little bit of fluid um, and uh, to jump on this early and start management. So what if we don't save the mean arterial blood pressure? Well, as I just mentioned, you can develop uh, organ injuries and maybe even organ failure. I mentioned too uh, both acute kidney injury and uh, cardiac, but there are others as well, including CNS injuries, uh, even respiratory injuries, uh, as well as development of metabolic derangements and um, um, GI as well as hepatic uh, injuries. So what are the goals of shock? So if a patient is in shock, again, uh, going back to the very basics, uh, shock ne isn't necessarily a blood pressure, and a patient can be in shock prior to being hypotensive. However, you know, real serious or significant shock, and the shock that we see in the emergency department or in the ICU or in transport of patients, or uh, patients do develop hypotension. So it's really important to maintain or improve perfusion. So we really can't see what's going on at a, a microcirculatory level, although we may get there. Uh, so we need to start out with something, and I think that something is maintaining at least the mean arterial blood pressure of 65 millimeters of mercury. Now you see different organs have different critical perfusion pressures. Uh, the one we mostly think about is the cerebral perfusion pressure, uh, and a normal cerebral perfusion pressure is about 50 to 70, depending on what the intracranial pressure is. Uh, there's coronary perfusion pressures, which is probably somewhere between 60 to 80, as well as renal perfusion pressure, and that's somewhere between 65 to 70. So we want to optimize hemodynamics. We want to increase cardiac output by increasing our stroke volume, maybe increasing our heart rate and our, our systemic vascular resistance. But again, it's a balance. So um, we may actually um, achieve uh, a mean arterial blood pressure of 65, but we may be getting that by over vasoconstricting. Uh, and leading to uh, decreased perfusion of our tissues. In fact, some patients, uh, they may be perfusing any lower uh, mean arterial blood pressure. But again, it's, it's uh, a, a place at least to start is a mean arterial pressure of 65 and then, and then go from there until we get to know more about our patient. So what are some signs of poor perfusion? Well, some signs, which aren't the greatest signs, uh, are mental status. Um, so is my patient hypoperfused and altered? Now, there are a lot of things, including medications, that can, that can cause uh, uh, changes in mental status. 
capillary refill, which I use all the time as a pediatric intensivist and as a pediatrician. I don't see it being used much in adults. However, there was a study uh, in adults looking at uh, patients who were uh, in shock and using capillary refill as an endpoint for um, a resuscitation versus lactate. And it looked like capillary refill was as good and maybe even better than lactate. And we'll talk about lactate in a second. Urine output is another marker um, for perfusion. Now, this one, again, may not be the best patient because you, the best um, marker as patients have end-stage renal disease or there may be other things that have affected the kidneys besides hypoperfusion. We can look at modeling of extremities, looking at uh, skin perfusion uh, as another sign uh, of adequate perfusion. And then I put lactate here with a question mark because lactate may not be the best marker. If, in fact, if you go back and listen to my video uh, on the basics of shock, I do discuss lactate and how lactate is generated. And uh, it may not be our, our, our best marker for um, uh, um, titrating therapies uh, for perfusion. So what are we seeing? What are the types of shock are we seeing uh, in the ICUs? Well, this was uh, uh, a study done called the SOAP2 trial, and it looked at uh, the epidemiology of shock. It actually compared dopamine and norepinephrine for all forms of shock. So you may work in a very specific ICU or somewhere where you see more of some or less of some things, but overall, the majority of shock we see is distributive shock. In fact, 66% of shock we see is distributive shock, and the majority of that, 62%, is septic shock. However, cardiogenic shock is significant at 16%, hypovolemic shock, 16%, and, um, high, and obstructive shock, again, you may see this more uh, in your practice, but is about 2%. So let's talk a little bit uh, about terminology. Now, most people say they're on multiple pressors, uh, we're, we're sometimes using these terminologies incorrectly. So what a vasopressor, pure vasopressor is, is something that induces vasoconstriction, where it works on uh, receptors on the, vascular, on the vasculature causing vasoconstriction. Um, these medications are, and we'll talk about all of these, phenylephrine, vasopressin, angiotensin II, and celopressin. The last two, angiotensin II and celopressin, uh, these are new agents that are coming out. In fact, angiotensin II is, is now on the market where celopressin is being studied. Um, angiotensin, sorry. Uh, next is uh, the term inotrope. So this is something that uh, an agent will, that will increase cardiac contractility, uh, purely uh, work on beta-1 receptors. Now, there is no pure inotrope. In fact, you might argue with me that at different doses, some medications are pure inotropes. Uh, but because it's a little bit messy at at different doses, it has other, these medications, which I'll tell you in a second, have other effects. I haven't listed any drugs under pure inotropes. Um, but let's look at what an inopressor is. So this is something, now just combine these words, it causes inotro increased inotropy, well, increases cardiac contractility, but it also uh, it causes vasoconstriction. So these medications are the most common, most commonly uh, used uh, medication we use in shock is norepinephrine. So norepinephrine not only has vasoconstrictor effects, but as I'll show you a little bit, it has also inotropic effects. Another one is dopamine. Again, this is one that's dose-dependent, as we'll talk about, and epinephrine, which is also dose-dependent. At lower doses, dopamine and epinephrine are more, uh, uh, more, I guess, probably more inotrope, uh, and as you get to higher doses, they, they become um, vasopressors. Um, and the last term is inodilator. So this is an agent that increases uh, cardiac contractility, but also leads to vasodilatation. So drugs like dobutamine, milrinone, levosimendin, as well as isoproteranol. Uh, last thing we'll talk about in this section uh, is the receptors. Once you know where the receptors are, what the receptors do, and which drug works on which receptor, this becomes a lot easier. So um, the main receptor, um, the main receptor, excuse me, that we'll talk about are first alpha-1 receptor. Well, where are these located? Well, these are located on the vasculature. So when they are stimulated, these lead to vasoconstriction. Um, the next is beta-1. Uh, how I used to remember this in, in medical school, and I guess I still do, is um, where is beta-1? Well, you have one heart, therefore beta-1 is on the heart. Uh, this will increase both heart rate and contractility, so it leads to chronotropy by increasing heart rate and, and, inotropic, and inotropy by increasing uh, cardiac contractility.
Then beta 2, uh, I'd remember, and I guess I still do, because uh, the lungs, you have usually have two lungs. Uh, so beta 2 is in the lungs. And when they're stimulated, or when beta 2 receptors are stimulated in the lungs, they cause bronchodilatation. However, uh, not that we don't care about the lungs so much, but in this section, where else is beta 2 located? Well, beta 2 located is located, uh, beta 2 receptors are located on the vasculature. So just like in the lungs, where they lead to bronchodilatation, in the vasculature, they actually lead to vasodilatation. And then the last receptors that we'll talk about are V1 and V2. Uh, V1 and V2, this is mainly, mainly talking about uh, vasopressin and celopressin. So when V1 receptors, um, they're on the vasculature first, uh, and when they're uh, stimulated, they cause vasoconstriction. V2 um, will um, uh, increase free water reabsorption, um, and this is when we talk about vasopressin. Vasopressin is also known as ADH, will, will stimulate V2 receptors to cause free water reabsorption. And then the last receptors we'll talk about are, uh, again, this is a new drug, is angiotensin II. Angiotensin II has, has multiple effects, uh, and I have uh, the kidney drawn here because it increases uh, ADH and aldosterone, so it can lead to water reabsorption. But the main effect that we're talking about here in this section is it's its effect on the vasculature. So it stimulates angiotensin II, stimulates uh, vasoconstriction. All right. So this completes part one of the management of shock. Uh, please join us for part two. I'm going to get into the specific drugs um, and uh, their uses in just a little bit, but I hope you enjoy this lecture, and we'll see you soon. Thanks.